Hello, this is Lillian welcoming you to the 1868th edition of the Enfield Talking Newspaper, dateline the 16th of August 2012. The readers this week are Joan, Beverly, Rod and myself Lillian with Cassandra and Colin on the controls. Local stories include Glorious Games Put the Pressure on to Boost Support for Youth Sport. And at last, it's left off, lift off, I beg your pardon, for sheltered residents. Clampdown on antisocial behaviour comes into force, and Dad's fury over slap at school. I have no special news items this week, so we'll now go over to Joan, who will read the first item of local news. In the wake of a slew of gold medals rolling into the borough over the past two weeks, there has been growing demand to keep up the medal count at the next Olympic Games and beyond. The government's announcement over the weekend that funding for elite athletes is guaranteed until 2016 came after Team GB finished third in the medal table, ahead of USA and China. And here, there are calls for more investment in youth sporting programs. Speaking to the advertiser, George Dimitru who was head of the gifted and talented athletics program at Turnford School in Chesant, where double gold medal winning cyclist Laura Trott was a pupil, said, schools have to support elite young athletes and the government should support the schools to do that. Over the past two weeks, we have seen the power of sport and the more we can get kids into sport, the more medals we can get for our own in future. It's all about getting people involved in all the fun of sport. It develops students a lot quicker and really helps in all aspects of their lives. But despite widespread support for encouraging sport in primary schools, Prime Minister David Cameron has insisted that an Olympic legacy depends on ramping up competitiveness in schools and on teachers volunteering to coach after school, a position which has sparked unease among the teaching unions. A spokesman for the NASUWT said, teachers already do a lot of work outside the school day, and to blame teachers for a lack of sport in school is extremely unfair. Teachers report they're under a lot of pressure to deliver numeracy and literacy results because of performance tables. Primary schools can live or die by those results, so it is understandable if those subjects are sometimes the main focus of teaching. Jan Hickman, Enfield Council's physical education advisor, agrees that getting young people inspired and enthused is key to future sporting success rather than launching primary school children into a competitive arena straight away. I think getting young people skilled is vital because that way, if you can go on to play well and feel good about yourself, you will continue to play and then compete, she told the advertiser. It's about finding something for everybody. If that needs to be dancing, then great. We need to be able to tell young people it doesn't need to be hockey or netball. After all, we all are different. Now, the advertiser's comment on all that is heading, All schools must be given a sporting chance of success. The government has committed itself to two extra years of funding for elite athletes. Of course, we want to recreate medal glory in Rio de Janeiro in four years' time. We don't want to be another Australia, leaping to greatness on home turf. But once the cameras and tourists have packed up and left, the funding and support for homegrown talent mysteriously dries up. But what about where Jess Ennis 
Bradley begins and others began. What about those vital years spent running around playing fields and being given the chance to learn and enjoy a sport before being launched into the heights of competition? This government has axed any targets for how much PE should be taught each week in our primary schools. That begs the question. What do primary schools desperate to drive up literacy and numeracy results do? Without targets for how much PE they should include, it is too tempting to abandon what some see as merely playtime in favour of extra reading lessons or more maths classes. But then, how is it fair to blame teachers for a lack of sporting support in school when they are merely trying to jump through the performance-related hoops that the government has laid down? And what is fair about then putting the onus on parents? Can this government really not conceive that most families do not have the time or resources to cart their children off to a range of after-school activities every day? Some have argued that too many privately educated athletes featured in the medal table. Without making it a truly level playing field with resources and opportunities for everyone, all we will ever be is a nation that came third in the medal table one year and then squandered it all in an ideological bonfire. A father is fuming after claiming a teacher slapped his six-year-old daughter in a classroom. Wayne Parks, who lives in Beaconsfield Road, Enfield Lock, received a phone call from the Enfield Primary School's head teacher on the last day of term, Friday, July 20th, explaining what had happened two days previously. According to Mr. Parks, a teacher witnessed another teacher slapping his daughter, Crystal, on the cheek during class. The matter was subsequently brought to the attention of the head. Mr. Parks, a father of two who works as a subcontractor for Thames Water, said, I just couldn't believe it. I was just fuming mad when I found out what happened. It's pretty upsetting to know that I basically went to pick her up as normal. You think everything is fine and then you find out what's happened. Why didn't they tell me before? The 30-year-old who noticed a small red patch on his daughter's right cheek followed, following the alleged incident reported the teacher to the police on Monday, July 20th. The Specialist Child Abuse Investigation Team is investigating the claim of common assault. Mr Park said no one from the school had been in touch with the family since the phone call, but he believed the teacher had been suspended. He claimed the school was trying to brush off the slapping by claiming it was an accident. He said his wife Susan was very upset about the allegation and the pair of them were moving away from the borough next month for his work. Crystal and her 10-year-old sister, Nicola, are due to start at primary schools in Kent from September. Although the family were planning to move before the incident at the school, Mr Park said he was now relieved to be leaving Enfield after 10 years in the borough. He said, we don't want the children going back into the school or any other school in Enfield because of what happened. It could have happened at school many times before. Maybe to our children, maybe to another child, who knows? I'm worried because if nothing comes of this, the person who did it will be allowed back to the school. He said he was willing to go to court if the teacher is not prosecuted as he would feel responsible if the alleged assault happened to another child. An Enfield Council spokesperson said, We can confirm that the police are investigating an allegation of assault against a six-year-old child at a school in Enfield. While we cannot comment on any aspect of the case at this time, we are cooperating with the police inquiry and following the London Child Protection Procedures. The safety and well-being of pupils and staff in our schools and visitors to them is our main priority, and we take allegations of this nature extremely seriously. Police and council officers are joining forces in a bid to rid Enfield Town of youngsters behaving antisocially. An order introduced on August 3rd, a year after the riots which rocked the town centre last summer, 
will enable police officers to tell people in groups of two or more to disperse in the area and not return for 24 hours. Those who fail to follow the order could face arrest and officers will also be able to remove and take home anybody under the age of 16 who is not in the care of an adult between 9pm until 6am. Christine Hamilton, Cabinet Member for Community Wellbeing, insists that young people will not be discouraged from visiting Enfield Town and says that the move is designed to keep troublemakers away. This dispersal order sends a clear message that we will not tolerate unacceptable behaviour and we will work to protect businesses in our town centres from crime and disorder, she said. The dispersal order will be reviewed fortnightly to check on its necessity and effectiveness and is expected to continue until February 3rd, 2013. Superintendent Paul Healy from Enfield Police said, This is a tried and tested tactic that we will continue to use in appropriate circumstances. The organisation has finally agreed to carry out repairs after leaving hundreds of elderly residents in sheltered accommodation with just one lift for almost three weeks. One of the lifts at Mendip House in Edmonton Green has been broken since July the 26th, leaving residents, most of whom have mobility problems, with just one remaining lift working. A spokeswoman for Metropolitan, which runs a block of flats for people who need support, said the lift was fixed yesterday morning. Residents said they had been forced to wait up to 20 minutes for the lift to become available. And because many of them have mobility scooters, only a few people can fit in the lift at one time. Betty Foot, 82, said, I live on the 23rd floor so there is no way I can take the stairs. The lift has been broken before, but it has never been this long. There are 184 flats, and some of those have more than one person living in them. So there must be at least 200 people living in this block and sharing the one lift. It is not acceptable. If the other lift had broken, we would have had it. But we complained. We kept being fobbed off. They don't see, seem to care about it. They might have fixed the lift now, but it was broken for nearly three weeks. That isn't right. A spokeswoman for Metropolitan said, We are sorry that the residents were left with just one working lift for over two weeks and understand that this was particularly inconvenient for those with mobility issues. The delay occurred because we were waiting for a replacement part and the manufacturers themselves had to carry out an assessment of the lift to determine which parts were needed. We would again like to apologise for the delay. Michael Lavender's column is headed with Council has gone from having £96 million in the bank to negative cash flow. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. First, the good news. Remember 2010 when the Labour government left the taxpayer spending £120 million every day just paying the interest on the debt? Between 2010 and 2012, public sector net borrowing has fallen by 2.8 percentage points from 11.1% of gross domestic product to 8.3% of GDP. This is a fall of 25% in just two years. It still means we are borrowing money, but we are borrowing less each year than we were two years ago. Remember that the taxpayer has not even started to repay the debt yet. Reducing the budget deficit means exactly that. It means the amount of debt is increasing more slowly. It does not mean that we have started to pay any money back. Well, that's the good news. And if that's good news, well, what's the bad news I hear you say? Remember 2010, when in Enfield the Labour opposition accused the previous Conservative administration of leaving £96 million in the council coffers unspent? 
Two years later, and notwithstanding the government providing a grant each year to keep council tax increases at 0%, despite numerous one-off grants, in particular an £11 million grant for new school places, and despite the sale of tens of millions of pounds worth of assets, the council has announced that it will have a negative cash flow by February next year. I must admit to being wrong. I thought the Labour administration would have bankrupted the council in four years. It has done it in just under three. That must not only be a personal best, but also an Olympic and world record. And who will the council blame for this? Let's wait for the lame excuses of government cuts and everyone else but itself. <clears throat> the feel-good factor of the London Olympics could have saved the country from another summer of civic unrest, says a Middlesex University academic. Dr. Anthony Goodman, Professor of Criminal and Community Justice Studies at the University, said that the economic gloom brought on by the recession was a factor in last summer's disturbances. During the riots, looters and vandals tore through a succession of London boroughs over three nights at the beginning of August. Dr. Goodman said, You have a growing disparity between the haves and have-nots. A lot of people who went there to loot didn't have a lot of life opportunities. The amount of income they get has been cut back. For a lot of people, they just don't see what life is going to offer them. The academic added that there is no simple explanation for why rioting, looting and vandalism erupted across the nation last year, but was clear that it wasn't about broken Britain. We have got to give young people a hope in life, and we need to look at things like supporting youth clubs and other activities that will engage them in constructive behaviour, Dr Goodman told the advertiser. The professor pointed to the buzz generated by the Olympic Games as having reduced the threat of further unrest. He said, at the moment, people feel as if they are a part of something. Stopping this sort of thing from happening again is about giving people something they can enjoy and believe in. Dr. Goodman also believes the excitement surrounding the Games could be harnessed as a long-lasting force for good. He said, what an opportunity we have now to put on more things for young people. This isn't about broken Britain. It is about the need to give people hope. And I have Vicky Pike's column on environment matters. The headline is, Olympic champion cyclists prove that making small changes really does work. Like others, I've been captivated by the wonderful spectacle of the London Olympics, the great performances, fantastic teamwork, commitment and hard work. I'm struck that commentators are seeking wider lessons from the experience and wonder what the environmental lessons are, above and beyond the example of a genuine global union of common aims and values. Firstly, the overwhelming success of Team GB cyclists, largely attributed to a pursuit of marginal gains in all areas, which challenges the scepticism of those who argue that small lifestyle changes to protect the environment are pointless. Team GB proves the opposite. Small, isolated gains may not be decisive, but collectively they can strike gold. If we each attended to our environmentally unfriendly habits and committed to incremental improvements in all areas, the overall effect could be an Olympian performance locally and globally. Furthermore, like our Olympic cyclists, we should embrace total honesty about poor environmental performance and deal with it fearlessly. The second lesson I draw concerns legacy, ensuring that future generations profit from today's efforts. The Olympic Stadium and Athletes' Village must benefit the local community and not become a costly white elephant, despoiling the environment. Furthermore, London 2012 reinforces the truth of a sound mind in a healthy body. Our children, thus equipped, cannot help but be good for the future of our planet. 
So I applaud our Council's investments in Enfield's green spaces and sporting facilities, the transformation of Queen Elizabeth Stadium and Albany Park Leisure Centre, installation of outdoor gym equipment, building on an Olympic vision which successfully increased pupils' participation in school sport from 20% to 80%. That was due to the previous Labour government investment in local sports coordinators and the requirement pupils should receive two hours of PE a week. I urge the current government to reconsider its decision to abandon these policies. Young people driven apart by the intense postcode rivalry that divides Edmonton are having their prejudices challenged this week at a summer camp in Epping Forest. The four-day camp at Gilwell Park is a chance for 120 teenagers from across Enfield to set aside the postcode and gang rivalries that have sparked violence in the borough and focus instead on fun, adventure and learning. The mini summer camp was the brainchild of young people from the Craig Park and Croyland Youth Centres in Edmonton, based in the rival postcodes of N18 and N9 respectively, who set up the Unity Youth Project to help young people in their area overcome the intense gang associations that stop some people travelling between boroughs. The 13 to 19 year olds at this week's camp come from 10 different youth projects across Enfield and an Enfield Council spokesman insisted that the four day camp is about promoting community harmony between some of the young people who hail from rival areas. Ava Orhan, cabinet member for children and youth said, this summer event brings many young people together, learning new skills and trying new challenging activities. They are taking part in team building and communication exercises, team sports and adventurous activities. She added that young people attending the camp would gain recognised national accreditations as youth leaders or as participants. One of the camp leaders, Ursin Ramiz, who manages Ponders End Youth Centre, said, The success of this camp is to get young people to expand their social skills beyond their immediate friends and learn how to interact with new people and how to exchange ideas. Working in groups, young people are able to find new interests and support each other. Police have stepped up patrols around Oakwood Underground Station after three women were mugged there in the space of nine days. The same man is believed to be behind the attacks. He is described as white, aged 20 to 25, and six feet tall. A woman handed over 15 pounds cash after the man threatened her with a knife at about 9.30 p.m. on August the 2nd. An hour later, another woman was kicked to the ground by the suspect. Her phone broke during the attack, and the man ran off empty-handed. A third victim was approached from behind by the suspect at 12.45 a.m. last Friday. He grabbed her bag, and a passerby shouted at him. He dropped the bag and ran off. Police have stepped up plain clothes and high visibility patrols, and officers are warning commuters to be on their guard. They are advising them not to use a mobile phone immediately after coming out of the station, and not to text whilst they are walking along the street. Anyone with information relating to the robberies is asked to call police on 101 or Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800-555-111. A couple have been left devastated after their cat was shot dead. 
Barry and Carol Owen of Onslow Gardens, Winchmore Hill, returned from a trip to the shops on Thursday afternoon to find the lifeless body of the cat, Cheeky, lying on the floor of their garage. After turning her over, the couple saw a bullet wound in Cheeky's side and a visit to the vet confirmed their worst fears. An X-ray showed that she had been shot with an air rifle, said 67-year-old Mr Owen. We think she was shot outside and then crawled into the garage to die. Mr Owen said he did not think it was an accident because Cheeky was killed by a single shot to the stomach. Everyone in the area knew her, he added. She was quite a character. She was a treasured and much-loved cat. We are shattered and devastated. The cat used to go into our neighbours' homes and the local children knew her. Everyone is shocked and devastated. We've had four cards of condolences. We absolutely idolised her. The Owens have looked after Cheeky ever since she turned up on the doorstep of their home on Christmas Day 2005 when she was a kitten. We put posters up asking if anyone was missing a cat, but she didn't seem to want to be looked after by anybody but us, and she has stuck with us ever since, said Mr Owen. According to a spokeswoman, police inquiries are continuing. No arrests have been made in connection with the incident. Witnessing the horror of the riots convinced an Enfield mum of two to create a website that would encourage more community spirit. Emma Rigby set up the Love Your Doorstep page on Facebook following the riots last year. It allows members to post messages, queries, advice and information about anything and everything in Enfield. The page has proved such a success that Emma has now set up a website, www.loveyourdoorstep.co.uk, and wants business owners to sign up and pledge their support. She said, One of the reasons I set up Love Your Doorstep was to try to bring back the community spirit we had lost. When I saw the rioters around London, I found it was like watching a movie. It had come out of nowhere, although I knew the country was quite volatile because of the recession. I had been thinking of the idea of the website for a long time. I was finding it hard to settle in Enfield, even though I had been in London for about ten years, six of those in this area. I really wanted to put down roots. Emma said that since creating the web page, people had made friends, and when she was out and about in the borough, she was always bumping into people she knows through Love Your Doorstep. It has made me feel more at home, she added. I have been getting really lovely emails from people saying what a difference it's made to their lives. I really think we have a fantastic community here. I'm not saying we won't ever see writing again, but we are more prepared and I would like to think we are a stronger community because of it and we are not scared to pull together. Love Your Doorstep has proved such a success that Emma is launching the scheme in other boroughs and even in the Essex village of Great Notley where 10% of residents have already signed up. We have reached the end of side one for this tape. Please stop your machine now, take out the cassette, turn it over and start side two.